Okay, thank you very much indeed, everybody, for being here to listen to us, and thank you for inviting us to come and present this study today. Is that okay now? Okay. As in the case of the study um, th that we heard about this morning, this one was carried out over nine months, beginning on in October 12 and ending in July 13, um, which was, as people mentioned this morning, quite... Um, demanding because we both had full-time jobs um, and indeed we couldn't have carried it out without the help of three other people who are not mentioned on the slide that you see there. Um, Maria del Mar Gutierrez Colón Plana from the University of um, Tarragona, Alberto Lombardo Casparos from the same university and from the University of Leicester uh, research assistant Fiona Soliman. We're extremely grateful to them for all their help. The aims of our project were kind of threefold. We wanted to examine how translation can contribute to the learning of a foreign or second language in primary, secondary, and tertiary education. Um, we kept an open mind in so far as our questionnaires were concerned that we sent out to people about what translation might be because we really wanted them to tell us about their own conception about translation. In the report, however, if you have a, a copy of that, you will see that we provide a very extensive um, definition of what we, well, not definition, but a sort of account of what we mean by translation. Um, basically, just summarizing that quickly, it's um, texts that are related as target text to source text. Whatever kind of text that might be, whatever direction they might go in, whatever medium it might be, we see that as translation. But you, you can look at the report and read that for yourselves. Um, secondly, we wanted to compare and contrast attitudes to language teaching methods in different countries. The countries were, the primary countries, were seven in Europe and which they were was partly determined by the, uh, the tender that we were responding to. Uh, and then there were three other countries from, from where we got information kind of spontaneously from people who heard about the study that we were carrying out. And our third aim was to propose guidelines for future action. Now the scope of the project was quite wide in a sense. Um, we collected data using two questionnaires, one for teachers, so language teachers, uh, and that was an online questionnaire, and one for experts. Those were people who had insight into the kinds of policies that governed how language teaching was carried out in schools and universities in their respective countries. Uh, we got a large number of responses, as you can see, here on the slide, we got 963 responses from a total of 15 countries. The five extra, in addition to the 10 that we had sort of bargained for, were Turkey, Lithuania, Sweden, Albania, and Italy, where colleagues very kindly sent us information because they would like to contribute to what we were doing. Of those um, nearly thousand respondents, two-thirds came from the member states and about one-third from, from the comparison countries. So we think we give a, a pretty good outline of what is happening in the member states that we uh, looked at, and I'll tell you which they were in a moment. Um, now we asked seven questions, and I'll just go through those now so that when I come to talk about them in more detail, you'll know what they related to primarily. So the first question was, can translation contribute to effective language learning? And the second question was, what is the comparative pedagogical value of translation comparatively to other methods? Um, those two questions we primarily found answers to from a literature review, which I'll also come back to in a moment. Our third question was, does the value of translation depend on the learning aims? We got some information on that from the literature review and some from the surveys that we carried out. The fourth question was, does translation currently form a part of the curriculum? Fifth question, so, so these questions that I'm talking about now were addressed by the, by the questionnaire surveys. The fifth question, is there a willingness to introduce translation where it isn't already used? The sixth question was, 
Are there different attitudes to the use of translation in language learning in monolingual countries and in bilingual countries? And finally, um, how can translation as a method of language learning be made attractive and motivating? And the answers to that question we derived partly from what people told us and partly from published um, um, teach ped pedagogical materials. Now, our case study countries, as I said, were partly determined by the nature of the tender, by the, by the description that we were given of what we had to, to do. Um, whoops. But the countries were that we selected Croatia, Finland, France, Germany, Poland, Spain, and the United Kingdom. Croatia was chosen because it is a small country and it is a new member of the Union. Croatia joined the Union on the 1st of July 1913, so actually after we'd already started the study. But obviously they would have made preparations for joining be before that. Finland was chosen because we, had, we, need, we wanted to have a Scandinavian country and also Finland is bilingual. We also wanted bilingual countries, clearly. France was chosen, France and Germany were chosen because they were large um, established members of the, the Union, uh, one of which has a, a rather better reputation as a language learning country than the other. I leave it to you to decide which that might be. <laughs> Poland was selected because it's a big country, relatively new. It joined the Union in 2004. Spain was selected as a bilingual country, and the United Kingdom was selected because it is so appallingly bad at language learning, and also because, in spite of that, it has had a number of very, uh, very specific uh, investigations or recommendations or studies of the learning of languages. The Nuffield Report of 2000, the National Strategy for Language Learning of 2002, and currently there's a revision of the National Curriculum for Language Learning in which we know that translation is going to be included as a, as a part of language teaching for children from the ages of 7 to 14. So it's a kind of interesting place to, to look at. Now these countries uh, are by no means um, um, heterogeneous. So some of them are very, um, have very different policies in, in different parts of them. And so for some of the countries, we focus on particular, on particular areas. So in Croatia, we focused on Zagreb. In Finland, we focused on Turku, because that's probably the most bilingual part of, 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 um, of Finland, where there, there's a lot of, uh, there are many Swedish speakers in Turku. Uh, in Germany, we focused on Rheinland-Pfalz region, primarily, in Poland on Gdansk, in Spain on Tarragona, and in the United Kingdom on England. Uh, France, we think, is more um, um, unified in terms of its language policy, so we, we sampled uh, all of France. The comparison countries that we selected were Australia, where there are many immigrant languages which are fairly well catered for, China, because it is a big country with an enormous growth and a great growth and in interest in translation in language teaching and learning. And the United States, because it's sort of big and sort of like Europe, and also there are um, bilingual parts of it, which we particularly looked at. We looked at Monterey County in California and Tucson, Arizona. Um, in Australia, we looked primarily at Perth. Uh, China, we sampled sort of all over, really. We carried out um, some literature reviews. We looked first of all on EU policy on language learning from 2002 to 12, which um, doesn't mention translation in any systematic way, really. And then we looked on EU policy on multilingualism from 2008 to 12, which mentions translation primarily as an alternative to, multiling to, to language learning. So, Either you put all your effort into language learning, in which case you don't need translation, or you focus a lot on translation, but not so much on language learning. I'm obviously exaggerating a little bit, but there was that opposition in that particular literature. Um, I could tell you which 
documents we looked at, but I don't want to take too much time, and, and maybe that can come up um, in questioning. Um, there's a third way, a third uh, policy, though, that we looked at as well, and this is the Common European Framework of Reference for Languages, which has been tremendously influential. A lot of our um, respondents referred to that document, and this document lists mediation, including, very specifically, including translation and interpreting as one of the main language skills to be acquired by students in schools and universities studying languages. So that was a little rich literature review of policies on language learning. A second literature review that we carried out looked into historical debates on the use of translation in language teaching and learning. And we focused particularly on the grammar translation method, which developed um, as um, an adjustment of the traditional scholastic method of teaching languages to highly educated individuals who would be given a grammar and a dictionary and would, by means of those two kinds of applied linguistics material, be able to work their way through very complex texts. This is a method of language learning which was not really suitable when large groups of students in schools have to learn modern languages. So for those larger groups of students, this method was adjusted in such a way that instead of just giving people a text and asking them to translate it, they would be working with individual sentences which, which could be graded for difficulty and which could also focus on individual aspects of language. But doing that meant that the individual sentences that such students would be working with would be unconnected to each other really and so that method of teaching language went against uh, the belief in um, the connectivity of ordinary language use which became um, much in focus in later years and which of course the foundation of so-called natural methods of language learning and teaching and uh, communicative language teaching. So there was a, a very strong reaction against this artificial way of looking at, connect, at constructed sentences away from that towards more focus on natural language use and really that sort of uh, was the final nail in the coffin of the so-called grammar translation method. We also looked at empirical research and I'll come back to that uh, in, a, in a little while but the empirical research uh, of, of usage of translation in language teaching and learning suggested to suggests that mental translation occurs in most L2 learning situations, whether you like it or not, and that translation activities can have certain positive effects on classroom discussions. So our first question, which we addressed primarily by way of um, the literature research was, can, can translation contribute to effective language learning? And we found from this work that yes it can and does, as I said, often as mental translation with certain exceptions as far as this literature review is concerned. It is felt that it is difficult to use even mental translation when there are many different first languages present in the second language learning class. Secondly, it's difficult to use when translation is understood in a narrow word-for-word -word sense because that can interrupt fluency in the second language. We also found that translation was far less present in primary school teaching. Here are some graphics um, <coughs> which represent our findings. I did, when I finished my part of this presentation, Anthony will show you lots more graphics uh, which um, will summarize our findings in a different way from my more discursive summary here. But this, um, these graphics here clearly show that translation exercises are, in fact, used in language teaching and learning. There is a sort of global mean, as you can see from this slide, in the middle, uh, middle to low frequency range. So most, most of our respondents said that they do use translation sometimes or um, regularly, even though... Um, there are other respondents who don't use it at all. But you can, you can clearly see the preponderance in the middle there, sort of some use. 
of translation. So it is present in language classrooms, um, regardless of what people feel about it. Our second question then was, what is the comparative pedagogical value of translation? And this is the comparative aspect here is to do is in regard to other language teaching uh, methodologies. And again, during the discussion, if you want to, we can tell you what those were. We found that translation isn't seen as a language learning method in its own right, generally. It is often seen, though, as a check on acquisition and as the way of exploring differences between language systems. We found in the literature that its potential advantages were clear. It has a positive effect on L2 writing, comprehension and discussion. And it tends to encourage people to focus on the structure and vocabulary of the second language, which is very interesting. It's a very interesting finding because one of the worries about using translation and language teaching is that it will draw attention away from the language to be learned. In the literature that exists, we find the opposite is the case. If you present people with translation exercises, they start to think about the differences between the languages and therefore also about the language that they are learning and its structures. Our third question was, does the value of translation depend on the learning aim? And we found from the questionnaire studies that translation is not perceived as enhancing spoken fluency. Now this is partly because um, translation, some, for some respondents, translation may not have uh, included interpreting, of course. Um, we found that translation has been shown to enhance the development of comprehension and second language writing skills, as I said. There was some suggestion that it might be valuable, valuable for intercomprehension, although we didn't find any, any clear evidence for this. By intercomprehension, um, we and our respondents meant um, a situation where people don't necessarily share one language, but they understand each other's language, and so every, each person speaks in their own language, but you understand each other, and that's fine. Um, we found that translation may be most valuable for learning aims that don't involve whole language systems. That is, so if, if the learning aim is limited to maybe language for certain purposes, translation might be more valuable than if the idea is to just sort of acquire the whole language system um, in one lot. And obviously, well, maybe not obviously, should never say obviously, but for developing spoken and written translation skills, translation was helpful. <coughs> Question four was, does translation currently form a part of the curricula in the member states? And here we found that in Croatia and Spain, translation wasn't used as a systematic approach to language learning. In Finland, it was not mentioned in the Finnish nat national core curriculum for basic education. In France, translation was banned completely from language teaching. That's not to say it wasn't present, but it wasn't supposed to be present, according to policy, from 1950 to the early 1990s. And there was some sense that it is still being discouraged. In Germany, the situation varies from land to land and is... Um, largely dependent on whether translation figures in the examination system, not surprisingly. Um, in Poland, translation isn't used as a systematic approach to language learning and isn't mentioned in the core curriculum. I mentioned Spain together with Croatia. In the United Kingdom, as I said, it's due for introduction in 2014 for children aged 11 to 14. So we look forward to seeing whether the world will be transformed in the UK by this. We shall see. Our fifth question was, is there a willingness to introduce translation? And we got some interesting responses to this. There was some, some perception among some people that translation was prohibited. They thought they just weren't allowed to use it. <coughs> 
there's no evidence to support this, but we did get quite a lot of responses, particularly from Spain, to the effect that parents of school children would be upset if they found that uh, Spanish was present in the classroom. People would like to see just, just the language to be learnt in the classroom. Of those teachers who replied that the curriculum forbids language um, translation in language classroom, 12% said they wouldn't use translation even if they were permitted to do so. Of 114 teachers who use translation never or rarely, 8% had never considered it seriously, and 5% said that they didn't feel qualified. 22%, that makes 25 teachers, said that translation is detrimental to language learning and 17 of those were from France. Um, I should add, really, that we did, we tried to get as many respondents as we, as we could, but the number of respondents from different countries varied widely. So you shouldn't see this as a um, definitive survey um, statistically fully um, um, significant, but we did our best. So take it all with some salt. Question six was whether there is a difference in attitude in bilingual countries. Of the countries that we looked at, there is bilingualism in Finland, Catalonia, in Spain, and the United States. In Catalonia and the United States, translation activities are used less than the global average, but that's not the case in Finland. In Catalonia and the United States, immersion, by which was generally meant a situation where Students are put into an environment in which they only use the language that they're learning. That's what was meant by immersion, mainly. Immersion is valued more than the global average, but this is not so in Finland. So there are these very interesting differences between Finland and the two other bilingual countries. And we can discuss what might have caused this. Now, Question seven was, how can translation as a method of language learning be made more attractive? And here we consulted available books on translation pedagogy, as well as our own experience and advice that we got from a number of people who approached us about this. And we found that it can be made more attractive if it is used as a goal-driven communicative activity. We were surprised by Opinions that we that um, we were we heard from various quarters to the effect that uh, translation was to be discouraged because it was a, it wasn't communicative. That that is a strange way of looking at translation. But when translation is seen as a goal-driven communicative activity, then it becomes much more attractive to students. It can also be attractive used as scaffolding in initial second language. Uh, learning. Now there are two ways, of course, in which students come to terms with a new language, or it can be used by the students themselves to work with the new language in the context of the existing language. And in a lot of, in, in those primary classrooms where the second language is present, uh, that is often seen as translation and a way of helping the students to get started, so scaffolding uh, in L2 learning. It can be attractive when it's used to train students to use and combine multiple language resources and different media. So there's a lot of research on the use of, for example, subtitles in uh, translation classrooms. Um, 
it can be attractive when it's used for interesting, challenging and amusing activities. And at the end of our report, and close to the end, there are some suggestions for translation activities that can be, be, um, be used in classrooms. The translation of recipes and the use of, for example, uh, machine translated texts which you can ask students to, um, to edit and to comment on the difficulties that they present. So, our main findings are that use as a communicative activity, translation can enhance the learning of a second language. That translation, as I said a little while ago, isn't seen as a language learning method on its own, in its own right, but usually is combined with a range of different approaches. In most cases, translation is not an explicit feature of language teaching curricula, but translation activities are nevertheless very common in classrooms. Translation can be used as scaffolding at early stages and as a complex activity at higher levels. And these activities have different relationships to language learning because early on, translation is used to uh, kind of assist language learning to get started, whereas later on, it can be used to make language learning progress um, uh, at speed and, and to help language learning to develop um, rapidly, perhaps. More main, main findings were that there's a tendency for translation to be used less commonly in primary education and more commonly in higher education. And this is something that's happened for, uh, for decades. So this, it's interesting for me to be here today because I one of the earliest, first things I did in my career as a university teacher was a study of translation in language teaching and learning. And here I am nearing the end of my career and we're still really talking about the same issue, although now there are many more opportunities, of course, to use translation in multimedia and so on in language classrooms. Okay, non-communicative uses of translation, such as grammar translation, are regarded negatively, and grammar translation has had an immense influence on this whole issue, and it's about time that we laid it to rest, really. Um, but to do that, we probably need people to form a different understanding of translation than uh, many people all, uh, have at the moment. We found that there's a growing theoretical research interest in the relationship between communicative translation and language teaching, and that translation can be a key activity in training students to use multiple language resources. So those were our main findings, and here, are our guidelines for future action. We think that steps should be taken to foster a view of translation as a goal-driven communicative activity beyond the universities, into the schools, and perhaps, if possible, the population as a whole. That second language teachers at all levels should have access to a communicative view of translation through publications, through online materials, or through short training courses. So we hope that it will be possible to get second language teachers sufficiently interested to undertake these kinds of activity. And now I'd like to hand over to Anthony, who is going to talk in more um, statistical detail about these findings. Thank you very much. <laughs>